Hey folks, thanks for tuning in and welcome to Reliability at Scale. My name is Santosh. I work here at Meta and support the infrastructure teams. I'm actually back in MPK, our Menlo Park campus, and it's actually great to be back here and meet people in person. Today, you're going to hear from a bunch of people and talk about topics that are pretty dear and near to my heart, right? We're going to talk about site outages, we're going to talk about reliability, incident response. And while these are hard topics to talk about, it's only by sharing our war stories and how we responded that we learn and grow together as a team and as an organization and as a community. So thank you for everyone who's actually pitching in. Now let's talk about what actually happened. October 4th happens to be my wife's birthday. And for any of you who are married, you know this is a day you cannot mess up. I had it all planned. I had taken the day off, had a cake, had dinner. In fact, I just finished working out and I was just stepping out and my phone went off and it said self zero site outage. Now listen, I have been working in infrastructure for 20 plus years, have carried a pager for most of my working life, but does it matter how much you've worked or been exposed to crisis? This is something that you never truly are prepared for. Before I dive into the actual incident, I want to make sure I highlight a couple of concepts that are important to the actual incident. The first one is our backbone network. The backbone network is tens of thousands of miles of fiber optic cable. They crisscross the globe, they connect all our data centers together, and the data centers come in different shapes and sizes. They could house millions of servers, and they could be small servers connecting us to the internet. Now, when you as a user open up one of our apps on your phone and go to, say, Newsfeed or something, the user request travels from the phone to one of our edge routers to one of our data centers. There, data retrieval happens, data processing, we figure out what we want to serve you, and it retraces the route over the network back to your phone. That is fundamentally the flow of traffic on a site. The second concept is EBB, which is our express backbone. These are, again, dedicated fiber optic cables, but they are meant to connect all our data centers together. They are divided up into eight independent and parallel data planes. Each one of these are completely redundant. So what that means is that we could take any single one of these data planes offline and traffic is automatically rerouted over the other seven and we can continue the site as normal. In fact, this is a pretty routine maintenance operation that we would take one of the data planes offline and do things like, say, a software upgrade on a router. Now, with this concepts out of the way, let's go to the actual incident. What actually happened? We had an engineer who was basically trying to do one of the routine maintenance operations that I was describing earlier, right? He went and issued a command that was meant to analyze the capacity available on all of the backboard. Now, the issue with the command was that instead of analyzing the capacity and reporting on it, it actually took all of the backplane offline. Now, in normal course of operations, we would have audits, we would have safety checks that would go and figure out that the command was bad and prevent it from running. Unfortunately, our safety checks had a bug that led the command through. So fundamentally, what ended up happening was that we took the whole backplane offline. Now, a second thing also happened that is important to highlight. We have many small servers that effectively serve our DNS traffic. DNS is basically the address book of the internet. You type in a simple web address on your browser, it translates it to a physical IP, and then traffic is routed accordingly. Now, these name servers advertise themselves to the internet via BGP. They also do something which is important to highlight, which is that they have a heartbeat. They do a health check across every data center to ensure that the data centers are actually alive. The, data set, the heartbeat failed because the data centers went offline. This meant that the name servers took themselves offline because they didn't want to black hole traffic. This was actually as designed. The issue was that every single name server ended up doing it, which meant that we black holed every single piece of traffic coming to the site. Now, we had an issue, right? So what did we do? What was our response like? First, and this is important context, that all of what I'm describing from when the engineer issued a command to the whole site going offline happened in a matter of minutes. This was fast. And guess what? We had no access to the servers. The network was off, which means we couldn't log in. 
Second thing, DNS was off, which meant that our network telemetry, our debugging tools, things of that nature were offline. The third thing, OB was off. OB is out of band network, which usually is the way you connect to servers if your primary network is unavailable, and that was off as well. And there's a fourth issue, which was that we were flying blind. We had no collaboration tools. We couldn't talk to each other using our usual methods. So we went old school. We, we started telephone conference calls. We had shared docs in which we were talking to each other and, and trying to coordinate our work. We created several Zoom calls, etc., in which we could coordinate our things. So things got a little chaotic before it got better. So we figured out that the only way we could fix the site was actually by getting physical access to the data centers. Now, this is easier said than done. Our physical data centers are designed with a very high level of security, right? Physical access is hard. Getting to the servers is hard. And even if you get into the data centers, you're, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of servers. Which one is the server you actually want to log in to fix? It's hard to figure that part out. So we had several break glass procedures we had to do to get engineers into the data center, figure out the physical location of the routers you wanted to log into, and then actually go and fix it. We did all of that, and once we got into the routers, fixing the issue was relatively straightforward. We had to flip it, and we did it. And we were back online. However, this is where we hit sort of the second issue. At this point, we were about four, four and a half hours into the outage. And when we looked at our data centers, we, had, we saw a big dip in electrical power consumption. We had literally had a dip of about 10 megawatts, tens of megawatts across the data centers. What that meant is that if we, had, if we let all the traffic back in, we would do the reverse. We would cause a spike of tens of megawatts of electrical power, which could potentially take us off the electrical grid. So we had to make sure that we modulate the traffic that was coming back in in a safe manner. Now, the good news is this is something we actually know how to do. For years, we have run something called the storm, the storm drills. These are basically our simulations of disaster recovery scenarios. In this, what we do is we take some systems offline, sometimes data centers, sometimes regions. And the idea is that each time we do this, we monitor the rest of the system and figure out how they respond. Over the years, this has helped us create some incredible tools like overload protection or DEFCONs, which you'll probably hear about later. So because of this, we could go and bring back the site, a data center at a time, and the site was back up and running. So now we were back. So what happens now, the aftermath, right? What actually happened after the site came back up? There's two things to highlight here. The first thing is ensuring that we collected all, everything we needed for forensic analysis. Remember, we did not have our usual tools. We did not have all the things we would normally do for incident management. So we had to huddle together as a team, even though all of us were pretty tired by this time, to ensure we did a brain dump, collated the logs, collated all our findings, and put it together. The second thing, probably the more important point, is about culture. Very early on in the incident, when we were still trying to figure out what went wrong, the, in, the same engineer who actually issued the command that took all of the backbone out came out and said, listen, folks, I did a change in the backbone, and it is correlated to when the site went down. I might have been the person who took, who took it off. And when you sit back and think about what he did, this is incredible. We have a very busy site, and you never want to be the person who's actually taking the site off. But he felt safe to come in and say it. So this is a reflection of years' worth of, bringing, of building up a blameless culture. So I was incredibly... I was incredibly proud that we could do this. The second thing to talk about is figuring out the immediate root cause of what went wrong. We had a system that should have prevented the changes from going out in the first place. So we had to fix that. We did a code freeze, made sure that all changes going out to the backbones were accounted for. And the second thing we did was ensure we pattern matched across all of infra to ensure similar things, similar auditing mechanisms that we needed to have in place for actually doing what it's supposed to do. And the third thing is much more about defense in depth. We have a storm system that is incredible. It helped us bring the site back, but it helped us by doing it a data center at a time. We had to upgrade it to potentially do 
multiple data centers at the same time or maybe bring the whole site back at the same time. So that is work in progress right now. And the last thing here is how do you emulate all the changes that are going on on the site? We probably do hundreds of millions, maybe billions of changes on the site every day. And each one of them is a potential risk, right? So how do you make sure that the development, the testing, the emulation of all these changes is done in a controlled manner so that the blast radius of each one of these changes is controlled and you can figure out what will go wrong before it hits prod, right? To wrap up folks, one thing I'll say is you can have process, you can have controls, but it boils down to people. People respond differently in crisis. Crisis sometimes brings the best out in people, sometimes less so. But what I'm really proud about is the team was incredible in how it responded. In a very high pressure situation, without the usual tools that you have at their disposal, they showed up and they showed up big time. And I couldn't be prouder. The last thing, it was still October 4th, still my wife's birthday. And so when you go through these things, you have some, you know, personal takeaways and you have some professional ones. The personal one is, thank God, I have, my wife is a very understanding uh, woman. So that helped. And the team ended up sending some wine, some flowers, chocolates. That certainly helped, I can assure you. The second thing I'll say is on the professional side is that this is to go back to what I was referring to when I started. Listen, we had issues, we fixed it, we moved forward. You will hear similar stories throughout today. And each one of this is a point that all of us need to understand and learn. We will make mistakes, but let's make new mistakes. Let's not repeat each other's mistakes. That's how we'll all learn. That's how we'll all grow. Thanks a ton for tuning in.